I'm Michael Clark and you're watching Meet the Farmer TV. Coming up next on Meet the Farmer TV. We want to introduce you to some of the technical concepts and some of the science behind food safety and, and also some beneficial insects and some of the tools that we'll use and an entire presentation about the technical aspects of nematodes. The trick with nematodes is your soil temperature has to be above 55 degrees. Meet the Farmer TV is independent reporting to get you the best information about local food and food from the farm to your plate. This program is a production of Meet the Farmer TV LLC in association with Planet Earth Diversify, Nelly Productions, and Leslie B. Jenkins Photography and Graphic Design. Here we are at the Planet Earth Diversified Processing Kitchen and we want to introduce you to some of the technical concepts and some of the science behind food safety and, and also some beneficial insects and some of the tools that we'll use. So let's take a look at some of our measuring devices. One of the most critical things is to be able to measure items by weight. So we have a gram scale and since we're using it for food products and we might actually sell some of these based on that weight, we have to have the scale approved by uh, the Department of Weights and Measures. Now we'll also need to measure liquid volumes. We can use a uh, calibrated uh, funnel flask or for very critical items we'll use uh, graduated cylinders and for very tiny amounts of fluid we can actually use pipettes. And now let's take a look at some of the labeling requirements. We'll look at uh, how to make a label, what needs to be on the label, the size of the type, certain marketing programs like Virginia's Finest, uh, the universal product code and barcodes, weights and measures. We'll also look at serializing each of our lots with a date code so that we know each product when it was manufactured and we'll be able to track its location in case there needs to be a recall or if we have a, an expiration issue with a particular lot. Another important aspect about being a food processor and operating an inspected kitchen is to have records. So what we'll have here is a logbook. Every time we produce a product, we'll record it, record the number of units, the particular lot number. We'll also have space in here for any notes, issues, uh, we'll keep recipes, any, any critical information, a contemporaneous record. Now another important aspect is to be able to identify food pathogens and to, to know that your food products are safe. We'll look at some easy uh, cola scan and we'll look at some methods and some easy test results to try to find out if we have pathogens on our food. Another important aspect is an inexpensive stereo microscope to be able to identify small objects some pathogens, and also for beneficial insects on the farm. Here we're looking at some beneficial nematodes, tiny little microscopic insects that will crawl inside our pests, lay their eggs, kill the host, and then thousands more will hatch out and repeat the cycle. We'll use these in the greenhouse to control gnats and worms, fungus gnats, various different pests that we don't want to have to use pesticides on. So here we're looking at a fungus gnat larva parasitized by our beneficial nematodes. The tiny little nematodes and the large fungus gnat larva. They will actually enter the body of the, the fungus gnat larva, take up residence, lay eggs, kill the host, and then hatch out in the hundreds. And so this is a, a natural form of insect control accomplished without the use of toxic poison. The beneficial nematodes will not survive at the temperature of the human body uh, and they don't in general uh, affect large organisms. They're very temperature sensitive, uh, they don't affect the plants. Now there are plant pathogen nematodes that are not good nematodes. This is a, a parasitic nematode that works only to kill insects. One of the important aspects is to be able to inspect the quality of our input ingredients, even our beneficial insects. We need to be able to examine them and, and make sure they're alive and viable. 
Many of our food ingredients also need to be inspected. The quality of our inputs certainly controls the quality of what we can create here in the processing kitchen. One of the important aspects about food safety is controlling the pH of the ingredients and the final product. pH below 4.6, most bacteria and pathogens won't grow. So now let's go back to the VABF conference for an entire presentation about the technical aspects of nematodes. So the supplier of the nematode, what you need to do is know what your pest is. And then when you order them is to talk with the rep and tell them what your pest problems is, is and they'll be able to tell you if their product is appropriate for you. Um, because you don't want to spend money and be thinking you're doing biocontrol of your pest when really it's the, the wrong product. Okay, there's also the issue of nematode host finding behavior, and I already talked about that. This sort of, some nematodes just like to sit and wait, like the ambusher nematode, Styronema carpocapsi, and then at the other end of that sort of behavioral repertoire is the cruiser nematode, heterorhabditis, that likes to move through the soil and will hunt out a, a, a pest. So if you have a sedentary pest that doesn't move around a lot, like a white grub or a root maggot, you know, you're going to need uh, an active predator to go out and find it. You don't want sort of the couch potato pest and the couch potato nematode, one sitting over here and one sitting here, and neither one of them are moving, so they're not going to meet. Okay, so, um, but if you have an active pest, like a cutworm or an armyworm, then it's okay if you're using this ambusher nematode because the pest is going to be moving around and it will um, come into contact with the nematode. So if you buy these nematodes, how long could you, can you expect them to last in your fields? Well, it depends. Depends on the temperature, kind of depends on the soil type. But really, most people who looked at them have seen that they really, if you apply them, they can't really detect them. Like by, if you put them on at the beginning of the season, you're probably not going to find them at the end of the season. They just sort of disappear or die or something. But that said, most people who are doing the research on these, they're just like doing them for a single season. So they apply them every season and they seem to disappear. And people go, oh, they don't persist, so you have to buy them every year. When people do look, come back to the same site and they look again, um, it turns out that some of these can sort of persist for a long time. It's just that not many people are looking at you know, how long they persist. This Steiner nemoglazeri was applied like 50 years ago. It was the first nematode that was com um, reared in artificial media and then applied. It was uh, applied to turf to control Japanese beetles in uh, New Jersey. And when um, some researchers came back to some of those sites 50 years later, they could still detect these nematodes so that they were still persisting and reproducing and going on, they had established there. So we can kind of develop a best management practice for soil organisms that include these nematodes, and that is to provide continuous energy to keep that soil food web vibrant and active, reduce tillage to maintain soil structure so they have space, minimize compaction, um, again, so they have pore space to live and work in, if you have a lot of disturbance, you want to have some place where there's a refuge, or maybe don't manage everything at the same time. So if you're going to till, maybe you till, you know, you have a rotation um, between crops that require a lot of tillage and crops that don't. Maybe you have a hay in the rotation. Rotate crops to reduce population of pest organisms. You know, any biocontrol agents, above ground or below ground, if your pest population is screaming and out of control, no biocontrol agent is going to be able to really on its own probably bring that population down. So we're going to have to use, you know, good cultural practices um, to keep our pest, you know, everything that we can, a lot of little hammers instead of trying to use that biocontrol agent as one big hammer. Um, and reduce the use of agricultural chemicals in soil, you know, they're biocides, <laughs> what can you say? So. Um, these organisms are happier where we're not using ag chemicals in soil. You're watching Meet the Farmer TV. You can make this work on your own farm. If we, if we look at the, the 
talk that was before this one, this was a biodynamic talk, and what we're doing here is applied biodynamics, okay? So it doesn't even matter where you are. You could have a concrete parking lot out here, and in a few years we could make that parking lot a biodynamic. You know what I mean. This, it takes a little bit of time. Well, guess what? If I bring trichopoda in, then my squash bug stock is going to go down, which is what I want it to do, right? And I want to preserve these, these, this insect, okay? So that is, a, you know, I mean, you're, you have biological wealth. You ha if you have the biodiversity, Mother Nature is inherently in balance, or you can help her get into balance, right? But you have to have the right bugs there in the first place. And so sometimes you have to bring them in, or other times, uh, you know, you'll have them there naturally, okay? <laughs> Give me a question. Harlequin bug. Harlequin bug, bug is the bubble wrap of insects, right? You just gotta squeeze them, all right? Now, here's what to do with Harlequin bug. And I've grown a lot of broccoli, so I've squeezed tons of harlequin bugs. This is har yeah? Huh? Well, you, you could let it go to seed, you know, or you, can, or you could actually seed it out. You know, what we would do is we would take the seed of Queen Anne's Lace and actually put it in one of our little speedling flats, the 200 cells and make a bunch, uh, you know, you get your little, your little set, go out. Here's the other way to do it. You go out to a field somewhere around you that has a lot of Queen Anne's lace and you wait until it's in seed. You get a Ziploc bag, you go out and you clip the heads and then you shake it and get all the seeds in there. This is the way I did my entire side of my yard. It was really great. I went to a Christmas tree grower my, friend of mine that had a really biodiverse Christmas tree farm. He let me clip, you know, about 50 Queen Anne's lace heads as the seeds were mature, mature, you know, they were really dry. And then I just took them and I sprinkled them out. And I have established, I, you know, it's been 10 years since I did that. And so I just make sure when I'm mowing my yard or weed eating or whatever, because that's on the side of my garden, but my yard and my garden kind of come together. And uh, so I just make sure to preserve that, okay? Okay, harlequin bug. E first thing is ecological kung fu. I'm using, you notice what time of year this is again, and you, you notice where this picture is? This is in my farmscaping. So the first thing I'm going to tell you is the, the most favorite food of any plant feeding bug are seed pods, green seed pods. So this is radish. Those things are waiting for the radishes to make seed pods. Another really good plant that harlequin bugs like is cleome or spiderwort because of the seed pods. So what we do, if this was my field and I'm protecting it from harlequin bugs, I've got my border around my field and I also use leaf musters. We had a SARE grant, I had a SARE grant with Charles Church up in Valley Cruces where we successfully controlled harlequin bugs. So the first thing is we have, uh, we have these trap crops, okay, and we can either spray that uh, mating pair with soap. I carry a little squirt bottle that's just got a little bit of Dawn dishwashing liquid in it, 10% solution, or you can use insecticidal soap if you're certified organic. It causes the same thing. I, if I hit that thing with a, if I hit those, that mating pair with soap, they're dead because it burns their wax layer off, okay? So you're going to trap them, you're going to lure them to seed pods. The other thing you have to have insect wise is there are three or four species of parasitic wasps that attack squash bug, uh, harlequin bug eggs. So, let me review here real quickly. The first thing you've got to do if you have a specific pest is you've got to make sure you have that pest identified correctly, right? Because it's not going to do any good if you're telling me that, you, you know, I mean, just make sure that you've got that. So, so do that. The next thing then is to take those life stages and spread them out. Okay, once you do that then, you start thinking of what natural enemies are going to attack each life stage. If I had a big drawing board in here, we could do each one of these panels here as a life stage and then we could write down everything underneath them and then we figure out what plants those beneficials like and that's what we plant. So we're doing reverse engineering to 
create, a, we're really going to do a holistic system. But I was trained as a reductionist, and the thing is, everybody in here is starting at a different point. So we try to bring this back down to kind of what the principles are and how to approach it. And so if you think about it, you want to identify the pest correctly. You're going to lay out the different life stages, what attacks it, and then what food plants it needs and what it needs to overwinter. If you start doing that, you're going to knock your pest populations down tremendously. Let's look at the farm from a biodynamic perspective, as our, as our previous speaker in here says, it, and look at it maybe even like a stock. Well, guess what? If I bring trichopoda in, then my squash bug stock is going to go down, which is what I want it to do, right? And I want to preserve these, these, this insect, okay? So that is, a, you know, I mean, you're, you have biological wealth. You ha if you have the biodiversity, Mother Nature is inherently in balance, or you can help her get into balance, right? But you have to have the right bugs there in the first place. And so sometimes you have to bring them in or other times, uh, you know, you'll have them there naturally, okay? Another question. Blister beetles. Blister beetles. Okay. Blister beetles are both good and bad. Blister beetles, as immatures, feed on grasshopper eggs. And then blister beetles will get, you know, they will form you to get the striped blister beetles that are yellow and black or the gray ones. And typically what I do is they feed in groups. They, they cluster. So what I do with blister beetles is, once again, I've always got my holster with my soap. And I always use soap as a last. Soap is like a cop having to use bullets. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not what you want to do. But I pull the soap out, and I spray all the blister beetles and soap them, and then they're dead. Now, back in the old days, people would move them with fire and do all kinds of crazy things. But, so the other thing you can do then is you control your grasshoppers. If you have fewer grasshoppers, you use Nosema locusta, which is a grasshopper disease that you can buy. If you can knock, you know, look at it in terms of percentages. If you can knock your grasshopper population down by 50%, then you've knocked your blister beetle population down by at least 50%. So by understanding these different life cycles that these different, you know, you figure out where their weak points are and exploit those, and then you can, you can really control uh, so by controlling grasshoppers and limiting the success of grasshoppers, then you're going to actually help to control blister beetles. And I'm saying soap right now because that's the only other thing that I know for that. Okay? But remember, soap is the, last, is the thing of last resort. And that's why I usually use it in my farmscaping in a real limited scale. I'm shooting it right at what I'm at. I'm not spraying my whole thing. Unless, like when we were first doing our harlequin bug stuff, I had a row of farmscaping longer than this wall that was just loaded with harlequin bugs. The thing to do is you want to test your soap at either half percent, one percent, or two percent. Those are the three recommended dosages. You want to hit with the lowest dose that will kill your insects and not burn your plants. Because the other thing would happen is once we would burn our mustards, then they're going to go somewhere else. So, we're, so the other thing is you can sequentially plant stuff like leaf mustards that would attract harlequin bug flea beetles and different things like that, and just have them continuous, you know what I mean, where you're planting some every two weeks or every three weeks so that you've got fresh material all the time and they're always coming to that. Okay. Uh, different species of eggplant, the filet mignon, for all kinds of insects. Right. That would include then a, a multitude of farmscaping around that area? Yeah. And okay, once you, what you do there is you want plants that mimic eggplant, right? So you're going to do your other solanaceous plants, all right? Now, one that's not real popular, but if you can control it, is something like, or maybe even have a, just a little patch of horse nettle yeah. to get stuff to come into that. And, and that, that will remind me of uh, flea beetles. I want you guys, I know somebody would ask me about flea beetles. Okay, flea beetles, here you go. I don't have to, you know, you don't, everybody's seen this. If you have really high populations of flea beetles, did Mary Barbacek talk about flea beetles yesterday? I was still flying back from Seattle yesterday. Okay, this, okay, flea beetles, the flea beetles that get on your mustards are not the ones that get on your potatoes. Every flea beetle 
is specific to a typical plant. And what they do is they go down to the soil line and they lay eggs and they have stuff that looks like rootworms, okay? So the way that we would break the cycle, in fact, here's, here's a real interesting one you guys will like. I was showing you that Johnny salad mix. Here, look at this. You're going to like this. Okay, the, the leaf on the right was Johnny's salad mix that we planted that had, we had horrible flea beetle problems. So what we were able to do was get a nematode, and this is on your handout, but it's called Heterorhabditis bacteriophora, or the, the quick name of it is HB, okay? And what we did, we irrigated that in. We you can either do it with a can, but we actually had six acres of drip tape, and we purged the lines, and they, they only cost $35 to put out an acre of nematodes, of these nematodes, okay? So you want to get them from a really high-quality uh, supplier, the leaf on the left is three weeks later. So we went from having a, a salad mix that was rejected by the co-op to within three weeks we had, it had two shot holes in there. Oh, we don't care. That's fine. All right. Now, the trick, there's always, tr everything has a trick. Every one of these things. The trick with nematodes is your soil temperature has to be above 55 degrees. So I got a call from Jake's farm where you see most of these pictures taken here. He called me in October and he said, my Johnny salad mix is starting to look like it used to. I said, well, what's your soil temperature? And he goes, oh, well, that's really uh, good. I got the soil probes right here. He had it and it was below 55 degrees. So what you have to do then is you either have to solarize your soil somehow, you know what I mean, to warm it up or angle it or something. Or now, here's the other thing they've done. They've gone up into Canada and they've found the same species of nematodes that are more cold tolerant, that will go down to like 45 degrees. Okay? So this is all stuff. This is listed. If you go, if you go back and look at this picture, let me see if I have it there. Okay. Flea beetles make the leaf on the left unmarkable. Leaf on the right with, or, you know, the leaf on the left then had the HB nematodes three weeks later in the same plot, but the real trick is soil temperature. And so nematodes are, f they're fabulous. I mean, you guys, you know, Mar Mary Barbacek used to be at NCSU when I was in Raleigh, and she's just a, a gift. So it's so neat to see all this stuff. There's even nematodes that can control Colorado potato beetle. But the real way to control Colorado potato beetle is just plant your potatoes no-till because Colorado potato beetles don't like no-till. And the other thing is, you get your ground beetles in there. There are specific ground beetles that do nothing but eat Colorado potato beetle. There's one called Lebia, L-E-B-I-A. It's a green carabid beetle, and it does nothing but eat Colorado potato beetles. Uh, when we did that at Virginia Tech, we did no-till. On five acres of potatoes, we counted five Colorado potato beetles. Did we control them? Yes, we did. Okay. So here's, here's the tricks. For example, soil temperature must be above 55 degrees. So all this stuff is on there. It may not be perfect. I have kind of a homespun website because I kind of you know, do my this stuff. But I, it's, really, it's really driven by you all. I mean, this is, this is hey, this is 24-7 on the web at Dr. McBug. You can also send me emails, and if I happen to be around, I usually try to answer them, but sometimes I'm pretty erratic, as you can, I'm trying to juggle lots of things. Any other questions, or what time is it? I don't know. Yeah? Can you affect the uh, surface image of the beetles by, uh, like, their rearing environment versus the wild environment? Yeah. You're using these insects in greenhouses. Is it that like the wild insects if you can, or towards the rear? Okay, so you are you talking about ground beetles? Uh, I, I mean, lady beetles mostly. Lady beetles. Okay, yeah. Well, here's what we do. We ha we have a group up where we are, um, New River Organic Growers, and and some other associated groups, and some other people that we know, and we monitor some of our fields. And so what we do is we just have a sweep net, and we go out and sweep stuff and sort it out. And if you need if you know if you need ladybugs in your in your greenhouse. There's two ways we get them. I either go, go across the road to Hoyt and Scott Combs because they have thousands of harmonia and I keep them in a jar and I keep them in the fridge and when I need them, I bring them out and use them when I need them. 
or I go out and catch them in the field and move them into the greenhouse. The trick with having ladybugs in a greenhouse is you've got to screen your entrances or else they'll fly out. So that's what we did. We just, we got, you know, we got some nylon screening because we, we grow a lot of our stuff in float beds or, you know, our early broccoli stuff. And we have the sides, you know, are, are open, but we put up screening. So the other thing we could do, for example, let me see if I can find this pretty quickly. Uh, let me go back to ladybugs. Because here, here's another thing that we, that we like to do. Come here. Um, ladybugs. It costs about $75 to $100 to buy 72,000 ladybugs that you can get in a gallon bag. Okay? The trick with using, okay, this was, uh, this was Jewel Moro's again where we grew that 8,500 pounds of broccoli. So the, the trick that we would do there is we can keep these things in the fridge for a month. So we put them out when we need them. And you don't want to put out, on a, on a plant like that, there should be one ladybug per two plants. Most people pour them out on the ground, they bump into each other, and what do they do? They run off. The other trick that we use is I got my other spray bottle that has 10% sugar water in it. Because the other thing is, if you don't have some of these plants, all you need to do is go out every third day and spray a little area with sugar water. And you're going to bring the beneficials in. You know, you're making your own artificial, artificial flower. So here, here is, uh, we use one gallon of ladybugs and it helped us to control three acres of, you know, broccoli pests. So the other thing with broccoli is broccoli can take up to 50% leaf damage before it cups and it's not even going to hurt the yield of the, of the actual broccoli. What we do is we wait, when that plant cups, when it has about a dozen to 14 leaves and we know it kind of cups, so it starts to look like a radar dish. That's when we get really picky about whether or not we have caterpillars or not, okay? And we would spray, you know, we would spray BT because, you know, marketing is, an, is a whole nother evil beast. And, and you know, that, that's been our biggest thing is to figure out how we can do our marketing to keep a really good price up where we're producing broccoli for six months and having it go out the door, okay? So, I think my time is up. Is this not correct? Okay, but... <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Use, use this stuff. It's yours. Well, there you have it. Another episode of Meet the Farmer TV. This program is a production of Meet the Farmer TV, LLC, in association with Planet Earth Diversified, Nelly Productions, and Leslie P. Jenkins Photography and Graphic Design.